cyber-enabled economic warfare attack. Cyber-enabled economic warfare is a central focus of FDD's Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation because evolving technology not only promises greater productivity for American society, but also enables America's authoritarian adversaries to attack the private sector and our economy, which is the foundation of our political and military strength. While we haven't yet seen widespread rolling coordinated cyber attacks, the Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates, testified just last week that China and Russia, North Korea and Iran are advancing their cyber capabilities, which are relatively low cost and growing in potency and severity. When a large-scale attack occurs, the U.S. government and private industry will need to work together to allocate resources, mitigate the effect of the attack, and share timely information to help assess areas of divergence between what the government and private sector will require of each other and to help to develop mechanisms of coordination. Now, FDD and the Cheritoff Group conducted a tabletop exercise with former senior government officials and private sector leaders. The findings of that exercise are what we are here to talk about today. Samantha Ravitch, CCTI chairman and visionary behind this exercise, will moderate today's conversation with a few of the uh, e exercise participants. Samantha also serves as the vice chair of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board and a member of the newly created Cyberspace Solarium Commission. But first, let me introduce David London of the Chairdorf Group to set the stage. David was the lead designer and facilitator for the exercise and serves as a senior director at the Chertoff Group, working with some of the world's largest companies to manage cyber risk and build effective security programs. Previously, David spent a decade at Booz Allen designing and conducting high-profile cyber exercises and war games for government and commercial clients. Uh, by way of housekeeping, I should note that today's event will be, is being live streamed, I hope, and I encourage guests here and online as well to join in on today's conversation, particularly on Twitter, that's at FDD. I'd also ask that you silence your cell phones. And with that, David, thank you and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. <coughs> Thanks to FDD and uh, to Cliff for the introduction. Um, at the Chertoff Group, we view cyber-enabled economic warfare largely from the perspective of American companies, uh, who we work with on the front lines, who are looking to separate the noise and the nuisance from the events that could take down uh, lifeline services across America, uh, the services that Americans rely on uh, on a daily basis. CEW and our exercise puts that dynamic on steroids. Sophisticated actors exploiting systemic vulnerabilities to cause debilitating consequences. And uh, as, as uh, Cliff indicated, government and industry coordination mechanisms do exist, but it was far from clear from the exercise whether they are agile enough to respond to CEW conditions, especially when time is of the essence. This is an essential truth that was a key driver for the October event, and it's why in we, we enlisted some of the most engaged and thoughtful minds for our exercise and for our, uh, our panel discussion to grapple with these issues. Last week, the Wall Street Journal published a piece by Andy Kessler entitled, Strike Back Against Every Cyber Attack. Provocative, for sure, but it does capture the sentiment of many American companies and people who feel powerless and outmatched as America's most critical infrastructure and our own identities are targeted and exploited. And while Cliff indicated full-blown CEW, cyber-enabled economic warfare, has not transpired in the US yet, the steady drumbeat of nation-state attacks that we read about on the news uh, that we seek to defend ourselves against on a daily basis remind us that this risk is persistent, it's pervasive, and it's highly disruptive to our way of life. 
General Michael Hayden, who's a Chertoff Group principal and who was uh, a key contributor to the exercise in October, crystallized the consensus view that came out of the session in October. That view is that there is a need to review and reshape the division of labor between the U.S. government and the private sector in addressing CEEW events and conditions because the current status, uh, current status quo has been outmoded both by our adversaries and by the ubiquitous technology uh, that we interface with every day. At the Chertoff Group, we, we work with clients to build resilient enterprises and effective security programs, and we believe that resilience is a key pillar for um, countering CEW conditions. Cyber resilience is often defined by the ability to anticipate, withstand, recover from cyber attacks, and then evolve from them as our adversaries evolve. And we believe these principles are uh, an interesting organizing principle, both for broader CEW issues and also for some of the insights that came out of our session in October. Anticipate. Can we look around corners? Can we maintain uh, informed preparedness? Now, this is a joint proposition, of course, between government and the private sector in order to coordinate response and also to enrich threat intelligence. Mechanisms like the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act is a great start, it's in place, and it is working to reduce legal impediments, but other barriers still remain. Withstand. Can organizations maintain essential functions in the face of adverse conditions? In other words, can an enterprise bend without breaking? It starts with a unified understanding of critical, or as the financial services sector calls, must run functions, and a commitment to protecting those first. But it's also about coordinated effort to maintain public confidence while severe conditions in lifeline sectors are threatened, particularly in this fractious political climate. Recover. Can we restore quickly? Understanding the interdependencies, not only the, depend the, the critical functions within sectors, but the interdependencies across them are key to prioritizing CEEW-related recovery efforts. And we must also evaluate the, advocacy, the uh, adequacy of existing government functions and authorities to address the unique cyber conditions that we may face. And finally, evolve. Are we learning? Are we adapting? Adversary <laughs> tactics and objectives, of course, as we all know in this room, are not static. And so our ability to counter CEW conditions is going to be contingent on our capacity to evolve as well. In events like this, building coordinated muscle memory between private sector and government, and other advanced planning activities we believe to be essential. The most important finding that Cliff touched on earlier emerging from the event is that unless the government and the private sector begin making and developing CEW specific procedures, we will be caught flat-footed in the face of cyber-enabled economic warfare. On behalf of the Chertoff Group, I'd like to thank our counterparts at FDD, and I'll turn it over to Samantha and our panel uh, to unpack our insights from that exercise. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, thanks to the Chertoff Group. Um, you know, as, as David and Cliff uh, mentioned, and uh, our reports on the table outside uh, kind of explain further, of course, cyber-enabled economic warfare is, is the use of cyber means by an adversary to undermine key components of our economy in order to weaken us strategically, right? So it really puts the, the private sector on the front lines of this battle space in a way that um, perhaps we, the U.S. government and the private sector themselves, haven't really thought through. Thought through the roles, responsibilities, expectations in the event of such a catastrophic type of attack. And that's really why we convened the exercise in the first place, um, to kind of level set uh, what each side thinks the responsibilities, roles, are of the other, 
Um, uh, and also then to come out of that, how do we prioritize what type of planning activities need to be taken? And, and that's what we'll be talking about with this very esteemed panel. Um, we really gathered some of the leading lights in the private sector and in the, in the government uh, to attend in October. And we are, we are really fortunate to have four of them here uh, today. Uh, uh, so starting from, from uh, the far right on the table, uh, Steve Chabinski is the former Deputy <coughs> Assistant Director of the FBI's Cyber Division and serves as the FBI's top cyber lawyer. Ted Craver is the retired Chairman, President and CEO of Edison International and he now serves on the board of Wells Fargo and Duke Energy. Suzanne Spaulding served as Undersecretary for National Protection and Program Directorate at the Department of Homeland Security, and she's now a Senior Advisor at CSIS. And Scott DePasquale is the President of the Financial Systemic Analysis and Resilience Center, which coordinates activities to mitigate systemic risk to the U.S. financial system from cybersecurity <coughs> threats. Um, so I'm gonna, gonna start off with Suzanne. Um, and, uh, you know, Suzanne, at, at uh, the tabletop exercise, you saw the scenario which had large-scale rolling uh, cyber attacks across our economy, across different sectors. So assuming that the U.S. government uh, designated it as a significant cyber event, incident, um, who, who at the White House would be brought around the table? You know, who's in charge in, in the U.S. government? And um, how would the private sector get their voices heard in, in such an event? So the, the way in which the government responds to a significant cyber incident is kind of laid out in Presidential Policy Directive 41, and uh, which captured what was an ongoing practice. So you have uh, both a cyber response group, which is really looking at policy and strategy. And that's going to be the players that you would expect. So you'd have folks from DOD, uh, both the Office of the Secretary of Defense, but also almost always somebody from the uh, Joint Chiefs Staff. Uh, you're going to have uh, the intelligence community there, probably ODNI and almost certainly somebody from NSA. You're going to have DOJ there uh, and almost certainly somebody from FBI as well. You're going to have DHS uh, at the table, State Department. Treasury almost always uh, is going to be there. And then your uh, um, SSAs. Uh, so the, the uh, sector-specific agencies. So DOE, if we're talking about uh, impacts on the electric grid, uh, 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 communications is almost always implicated. DHS is the SSA for comms and for 10 of the different 16 sectors, but there are agencies out there for the others. So that's um, really the primary group that you would have coming around the table and in the context uh, that was playing out very quickly in the scenario where you've got also geopolitical tensions and a potential uh, effort to mobilize the military, et cetera, you're going to have those meetings at very senior levels. And it's going to be almost indistinguishable from an NSC or, or a, 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 a deputies committee uh, meeting, I think, initially uh, on those issues. At the same time, though, you've got, so that's policy and strategy. At the same time, you're standing up a, u <coughs> a, a unified uh, cyber Coordination Group, a UCCG, and that is the, to focus really on the operational pieces. Who can bring what to the table, uh, and, and how are we going to coordinate our operational activities? So again, all the same players, but, but much more operationally focused. So DHS, for example, at that would be represented primarily probably by the NCIC, our National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. And so it would be more of an operational focus, and that is where explicitly there is a provision for the private sector to be at the table, which is vitally important. Um, not only because uh, it is the private sector that is likely the victims here, the targets of this uh, cyber uh, attack, but also because they are going to have the tools and resources for responding to that uh, in conjunction with the government. That, they, that it's going to, uh, a, lo a lot of it is going to fall on them. They're also there, I mean, at the, CR at the CRG, DHS and the sector-specific agencies that are relevant are going to be turned to by policymakers to say, what, what is the impact here? What do we know? What's our situational awareness? And what can we anticipate? And DHS has stood up. I stood up a cyber and infrastructure assessment group. It's now the National Risk uh, Management Center that works with the private sector to look at these interdependencies, cascading consequences. What are, what should we expect? What is the 
not just the consequence today, but what's going to be the consequence in the next few hours, days, and months. Uh, and that's, that's what uh, the policymakers would look to. At the, at the coordination group, it is who has what levers to bring to bear to mitigate those consequences. Right? And so that's, a, again, a huge part of the resilience. And it's not just going to be your IT folks. Right? And so very quickly, Ted can talk about this. When we did these big grid X exercises for the electricity sector, uh, the CEOs are very quickly talking about where can we get, can we get this much copper wire? How are we, you know, how are we going to get things back up and running in a degraded fashion? Um, so th those are the, and, and then of course, we are going to be getting that situational awareness by being in direct contact with our private sector folks. Some of them sit on the NKIC floor. On our operations floor at DHS, we have seats for the uh, financial services ISAC, for the uh, electricity ISAC, for the multi-state ISAC, so that we're getting on the ground what's happening all uh, across the country. A number of uh, private sector folks, as well as the interagency, that are going to be right there on the ops floor, getting what we're getting at the same time we're getting it and providing that same real-time uh, information. And then we get folks on the phone. Caitlin Durkovich, who was uh, Assistant Secretary for the Office of Infrastructure Protection, um, their group was able to get sectors and the cross-sector uh, groups on the phone within a very short period of time, you know, sometimes less than an hour, uh, to get folks on the phone to say, what do you need, what's happening? Mm. That's great, great, thank you. Um, <coughs> Ted, you know, you've been a, a major figure in, in uh, the electric power industry for many, many years and, and you know, sitting a, a, as you do in the private sector and at the scenario there were other members of the private sector, um, some, you know, not as perhaps well versed in the language and speak of, of Washington with all of the letters and the acronyms. Um, but you know, when when you think about this, uh, first from the electric utility standpoint, um, uh, what mechanisms exist, uh, you know, in and amongst um, uh, yourselves, and then as you saw in the scenario, uh, other other sectors that rely on electricity up and down the the pipeline. What 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 comes to mind in terms of what? What concerns you? What keeps you awake? Um, or you know where you think we're we're in pretty good stead? Yeah. So, particularly with the electric grid, uh, maybe self-serving or uh, self-importance, but we tend to think everything relies on electricity, uh, which is actually in our modern society pretty accurate. Uh, you can't move water without electricity. Uh, most of the transportation networks don't work without electricity. So on and so forth. Uh, so a lot of uh, time and attention has been spent on how do you protect uh, the grid as much as possible. Uh, and in fact, enterprise systems, uh, so uh, whether it's accounting systems or uh, people-related systems, those things are important and well protected, but they're kind of secondary to the operating system that manages the grid. And indeed, it's largely isolated from the, uh, from the enterprise systems at each of the companies. Uh, so a heavy focus on that part. Uh, I would say uh, one challenge is that the electric system is not made up of you know, four or five big companies and maybe a few smaller ones. It's made up of over 3,000 companies. Some of those are uh, state-owned, some of those are county or municipality-owned, some of those are uh, what we call co-ops. Uh, about 45, 46 of those are owned by uh, what we call investor-owned utilities, uh, which Edison was one, Duke's another. Uh, and about 70, 75 percent of the assets and the customers are within that uh, investor-owned group. Um, so one of the challenges is how do you manage a grid that has over 3,000 people, uh, 3,000 entities rather, that uh, have a connection into it uh, and that have a part of managing that. Um, starting in around 2012, late 2011, 2012, uh, a huge effort was put in place to try to bring all of those uh, CEOs from the investor-owned utilities plus uh, the municipal and co-ops uh, together with 
government, uh, DOE and DHS, uh, Suzanne was very much involved in that effort, uh, to really start that coordination process so that um, we could get good information sharing between the government and these 3,000 plus entities, uh, and we could coordinate resources um, and uh, be able to share uh, resources across uh, all of those pieces that touch the grid. Um, I think a, another strength actually is that the grid is uh, this large multi-pathed network uh, and it has a lot of built-in and engineered resiliency uh, and the fact that there are actually so many islands uh, that are interconnected uh, probably creates a strength if in fact uh, a serious attack was mounted on the electric system. Um, we could talk more about that maybe a little later, but um, I think that's actually a strength, although it can be a challenge just trying to coordinate all of the pieces. Um, and there's a culture within the industry uh, of mutual assistance. We've had for decades uh, mutual assistance programs uh, really for addressing natural disasters, so hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires, and so on. Uh, and uh, this is where all the utilities across the country and actually in Canada and a little bit in Mexico as well will uh, jump in and help uh, a utility or group of utilities recover. Uh, the, one of the natural disasters that uh, occurred during the time that uh, Suzanne and I were working on this uh, was Hurricane Sandy and we had in fact uh, Edison trucks and people uh, were airlifted from California into the Northeast uh, to deal with Hurricane Sandy. Uh, so obviously a cyber attack is a different animal than a natural disaster, but the focus is still the same. That's trying to keep the grid up and running, trying to isolate the problems, uh, trying to speed recovery as much as possible. And I think one of the greatest strengths is the industry is very used to working with each other uh, in these mutual assistance packs uh, to, uh, to quickly restore. Um, where we're spending more and more time now is on the cross-sector piece, which uh, Suzanne just mentioned, um, and there are really five sectors that are most involved <coughs> in this, uh, communications, finance, water, uh, natural gas, transportation. Uh, so all of those pieces are interrelated and trying to ensure that we have that same type of mutual assistance and working together to try to manage the, uh, the issues and uh, really restore the grid, but also restore the other interconnections that uh, make it all work. Um, so I would say, uh, it, kind of in sum on that, I think there's a good culture and a good uh, background for working to um, protect and maintain and restore uh, in severe outages, uh, but it is a complicated uh, group of industries and companies that have to work together and work with government in order to, uh, to share resources and share information to, to really uh, keep the systems, those lifeline systems safe. Yeah, that, that's a great point, and I think we saw during the tabletop that, you know, different sectors who have different you know, experiences working with the government, different um, expertise, uh, longevity working with the government, um, had different expectations of what the government could provide to them, um, as well as um, what would be expected from and of them. And, and there was a kind of a robust discussion in this particular point on the need for attribution. Um, if this, if a type of attack occurred, um, would the government, how would the government go about making attribution, the importance of attribution to the United States government as it proceeded along in the, in the wake of a, of a large scale um, a malicious attack, and, and what the private sector kind of thought about that. Um, and there was different, there was a, 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 a bit of a robust discussion amongst the private sector um, uh, participants about the value of attribution. Um, to their own mitigation efforts, and you know, Scott, um, uh, talk talk a little bit about 
uh, you know, that in terms of the financial sector does value attribution. They, they understand it um, uh, and why, why they understand the importance of it and how defenses can actually be strengthened by anticipating the attacker's playbook and perhaps how other sectors would, would um, uh, it would be good for them to understand this as well. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it depends what seat you're sitting in and at what moment in time, right? You, if you expect the U.S. government to suppress activity that's persistent and, you know, use the DDoS attacks, uh, uh, Ababil, uh, back in 2012 and 2013, if you expect the government to do something about it, the government is going to need to refine its understanding of attribution. It's going to need to understand the impact the adversary's having on a key piece of critical infrastructure. And so the question is, what might the private sector have in its possession because they operate that critical infrastructure? They have the most robust and highest fit fidelity information about what's happening on that front line. What kind of partner can we be to the government to allow them to make a better decision around that threshold of impact so they can take an action? And so, uh, you know, if the, answer, uh, if the answer is you expect to play some role as a partner to the gover government in that, then attribution is pretty important. Um, if you're on the front line of defending the network, what you care about at that moment in time is what does the malicious activity look like? How, how, how do I find it in my system? Who in the sector? can help me understand the quickest way to eradicate that because it's, you know, it's likely happening ac across dozens if not hundreds of other entities, right? So the information sharing community becomes the important first line for that. And as a network defender, you want, you know, binaries and hash values and you want to know what to look for. You don't need to know at that moment whether that's Iran or North Korea, you need to know how do I get it out of my system and clean it and, and produce business as usual for, for, for my stakeholders. So it really, it's not a one size fits all shoe. It depends what seat you're sitting in. But if you want to um, you know, look at the long, long pole in the tent and get ahead of these things, I think it's really important to understand um, you know, what geopolitical actions, whether it's a breakdown of GACOPA or, or uh, what the environment is that's creating, um, you know, the type, of, um, the type of attacks or at least the type of reconnaissance mm -hmm. that might impact you in a couple of weeks. So from a strategic standpoint, I think there's a pretty strong case to be made that if you're going to partner with government, you're going to have to be able to contribute to that outcome, and particularly if you want the government to take an action on the other side of an event or during an event. Yeah, and uh, uh, Steve, certainly even as the, the U.S. government has gotten better at attribution, there's still some information that is critical um, that uh, for attribution that resides with the, the private sector. And there was actually a, a very good conversation as well um, about what the private sector, uh, uh, what kind of data can the private sector provide to, to the U.S. government. Um, some misunderstandings uh, as well. It seemed that that the legal and reputational concerns, um, breaking those down into two kind of baskets. Uh, so start with the legal side and in terms of liability protection to the, to the companies. That, but then also how do we, maybe the harder question, is how do we deal with the reputational concerns that companies would have providing data, such data during times of crisis to the, to the government? <laughs> That's a lot to unpack, so me, I'll, I'll try my best. First, let's start with the attribution of why we're even having the conversation. What, what does the government need? Why, why is information sharing even a thing? Uh, I'm not the strongest advocate of talking about information sharing as though it's the end goal, right? There should be some strategy that if it requires information, that's great, let's figure out how to share it. But there's a lot that can be done without anyone passing any information to anyone because there's a lot out there. But I do agree, you know, starting off with Scott's proposition that if you don't know um, who the actor is, um, a couple of things, you don't know if they're coming back after you get them out of your system. Is this an opportunistic attack or is it a targeted attack? Um, and of course, if we're going to have any deterrence value, it's important to know who's doing it. So where is the information for attribution so you can make these decisions? Um, by and large, it's internationally acquired because hackers don't just start where their box is and then go straight to the victim. And so it's going to be routed through a lot of places and that creates an enormous ecosystem of tracing back where activities come. Um, so you have an, art, an infrastructure that's being used by attackers, that's one thing. Then you have the methodology itself, which tends to be in a couple of locations, one on the actor side, but then on the victim side. 
seeing what the malware is, what commands are being entered on that system. Um, and when you pull all that together, that you have this environment, this architecture, where people are using, you know, they're, they're um, purchasing domains, they're using email addresses to do so, um, they're setting up servers, they're breaking into servers, they're extending their reach from there, they're doing the same thing to possibly a thousand victims at once. The end point, right, you're seeing the same types of malware. Um, what's interesting, when you put all that together, um, a lot of folks think that, well, attribution is, well, this malware was used by this country, therefore we see that malware. You can't say that that's that country. Anyone could use it. That's true, of course, anyone. But when you pull together all of the areas that we're talking about, right, where you pull the string on this totality, where you get to say, well, this is interesting. The architecture that's being used, the IP address, the domain, a year ago it was being used to target dissidents of this one country, and now it's aligned against companies that actually have the exact technology the country is looking to acquire, and next week is having a summit on that. You start saying to yourself, okay, you've got a motive. You've got not just the tools that are being used, but the exact architecture. What are the odds that some other party could actually acquire all of that and then use the exact same tradecraft to do it? And not only that, but would actually have the motive to do it. And the intelligence community thinks this way, right? You have this red team analysis where you're saying, okay, could it even be somebody else? We have all the reasons why we think it's this country. Is, let's come up with some alternative competing hypothesis of someone else that it could be. And that's how you start gaining this high level of confidence about who's doing it. And then you try to take your action. So the first question is, what are those information pieces that are needed and who has them and can that information be shared? And what's been remarkable, at least in my career, I've been doing this since 1998 um, on the cybersecurity side, is how often companies say that there are impediments on the legal side to sharing information when none actually exist. And it's really a nice way of saying to the government, um, we don't really have any motive to share. We don't want to share. It's you know, either going to be a cost against business or it's going to be somewhat difficult for us to get the approvals. And, so what we're going to say is we would love to share, but we can't. And it's your fault because the laws don't permit it. And the way we know this to be true is every time some, I guess there are two reasons. Every time there's been some discussion about, well, what are the laws? FOIA, antitrust, um, liability, civil liability, someone will sue us. What ended up happening is the government met the private sector and said, okay, we're going to give you a letter. We're going to give you a law. We're going to say this isn't an issue. And then the next point would come up, well, what about this? Then there got to be the meeting, the letter, the law, and most recently in 2015, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015, now three years old, which basically said you'll still retain your attorney-client privilege. No one can sue you if you're just handing over threat information. It's not an antitrust violation. FOIA doesn't apply to this data. The regulators can't use it to regulate against you. It, the list went on and on. It's like, just, and guess how much more sharing we got? So it's a canard, right, that there are these legal impediments. Um, but you asked another important question about, well, what about reputational risk? And I think that there are a couple of things of what is the motive to share, right? So one of the motives to share is what's the point of it, right? Why, do, why, does, why does anyone need this information? Does the private sector need it to have a better defense? Does the government need it to help the private sector or to take actions against it? That case really still very seldom gets made up front, meaning we're looking, we've got a couple of gaps, and those gaps would make a difference to our strategy. And that is seldom articulated, and so that rationale for why it's needed has to really be the beginning point. The other issue is now it's gotten to the point where a lot of companies make it a marketing right decision that they're about privacy, right, and that there may be a tension with sharing data, whether it's between private sector companies or with the government, versus this public statement of saying to the private sector, we won't share any of your data. Um, and I think that, that require, it's, it's a bit simplistic because the data that would need to be shared isn't about the customer. But it could indicate information that is acquired, right, that private sector companies have. It could indicate access capabilities that the private sector may have, that even though in that instance, the information that is being shared is clearly for cybersecurity, national security purpose. It implies something greater that the company doesn't want to be part of, whether it's working with another nation 
or just showing what the capabilities are. Um, and I think that when we were talking about, well, what's the strategy, what's the rationale, why do you need it, if that could be more aligned with what is actually being shared and how is it protective of civil liberties and human rights, that we can make a lot of progress here. But it's not the legal issues that are the challenge. And we'll, we're going to circle back because uh, what Steve was saying was absolutely, it took up a, a, a good chunk of what we were talking about at, at the, the tabletop, what, what the private sector um, already understood, what was a canard, as, as Steve was saying, um, but this sense of, you know, U.S. government, don't just say you need everything. Tell us specifically what it is and what it will be used for. So in some ways, the prioritization of the ask. Um, and the other, other piece of the importance of the prioritization of resources, um, it goes to stockpiling parts of the most vulnerable and important critical pieces of our supply chain. Um, and so, Ted, I, I want to ask you uh, about this question on, on supply chain and, and how it figures into, you know, cyber risks and, and you know, to, to talk a little bit about what you were thinking as we were, you know, going on this tabletop about, you know, do we need to start prioritizing resources differently in the event so that we are prepared and can uh, have the resilience and can reconstitute, if need be, if there were a catastrophic cyber-enabled economic warfare attack. Yeah. This is a really complex area, and there are a lot of dimensions to it. But I would say probably the starting point is um, on the supply chain, I think we tend to think of it as uh, mostly a potential vulnerability. We have a lot of, uh, most utilities, uh, I'll focus primarily on those investor-owned utilities that uh, manage about 70% of the grid assets. Um, they don't make or build a lot of things directly with their own employees. They use uh, a lot of uh, contractors to do this. Um, so the supply chain, uh, both on product and service, is quite extensive. Uh, and a lot of those companies uh, are significantly less sophisticated mm -hmm. in terms of cyber issues in particular. Uh, so a lot of effort over the last four or five years has been spent on how through your contracts can you get, in a sense, audit rights, the ability to come into um, these firms and get a better uh, sense for what level of uh, protections they have on uh, software and particularly where they're connecting into parts of your system. Um, so I'd say the supply ch that's one element of the supply chain. The other part, all the way to the major parts, spare parts and so on, that I think uh, is actually in pretty good shape. That's again been something that the industry has been doing for decades around uh, responding to uh, grid outages and natural disasters. But just to put a little point on it, uh, one of the uh, kind of most important pieces of the grid are what we call AA transformers, and these things weigh tons. Uh, they are huge. In fact, in order to move one transformer, uh, often will require four or five uh, days to get it a small distance. Mm -hmm. uh, so getting those transformers in strategic locations in the grid uh, and lining up the transportation that's going to be required they have these things called hoffers, which have uh, anywhere between 15 and 20 axles uh, just to be able to carry these things. It takes up a whole road in order to move it. So things of this nature have been uh, focused on for many, many years. Uh, and I think generally speaking, we're in pretty good shape on uh, having strategic <coughs> spares in strategic locations around the grid. I'd say the final part uh, comes back to that um, uh, cross-sector part. Um, we rely on natural gas in order to uh, get generators up and running. Uh, we rely on the communications network to get the system going. When you have to uh, get a grid back up and running, you don't just go over and flick the switch. You have to go through a whole complicated black start process and then you have to be able to synchronize all of these grid assets, uh, it's the phase angle and all of this stuff that engineers love to talk about, 
being able to get the grid back up and running uh, is a multi-day process if it is if a significant outage has occurred. Um, and being able to ensure that you have people really trained on how to do the black start process mm -hmm. as opposed to just going through the simulators, uh, but really understand how that whole uh, piece works uh, is again something that I think the industry is continuing to focus on. Uh, yeah, Suzanne, um, we, had, we had talked about how the electricity um, industry is is probably leading, you know, the way on on as as Ted was talking about uh, stockpiling of certain, you know, uh, uh, critical spare parts. Um, but when you look at, you know, kind of the broader risk assessment, risk management of the economy as a whole, um, what are your thoughts on where we can really kind of push ahead? Yeah, well, it's 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 really interesting. I mean, the, Ted is absolutely right that the electricity sector, like the financial services sector, and a few others, uh, you know, spent a lot of time at the CEO level. I mean, I met three or four times a year with thirty or forty CEOs uh, from of the electricity subsector coordinating council, I'm really focused like a laser beam on really on resilience. Really, at the CEO level, what you're what they're really focused on is how do we keep our uh, providing the good or service that we provide to the public. How do we keep that going? You know, just terrific efforts and great progress made. But it is also, there was also a recognition that some of these things that they rely upon, for example, for natural disasters, like these mutual assistance uh, arrangements, may or may not work in the context of a cyber incident that is cascading across the country. So in the case of a, even, even something as huge as Superstorm Sandy that was up and down the entire East Coast, it was the East Coast, and it came through, and it was gone. And so you could airlift things from California. You could bring stuff in from Ohio, et cetera, to surge resources, because they weren't going to get hit next. Uh, the, the challenge, uh, you know, and this, I remember these conversations in the context of, of bioterrorism and biowarfare and emerging outbreak of emerging disease, even natural outbreaks, um, and, the, and this notion of sharing pharmaceuticals and what have you from one state to another. If you don't know how it's going to spread and whether you're going to be next, you're going to be reluctant to airlift your, your supplies. Uh, and there is a recognition of this, and so sort of how do you adjust your normal plans for a cyber um, incident, uh, in addition to understanding that one of the most important assets that you're going to want to share and surge is, is a cyber workforce. It's, it's not, it, you know, transformers have traditionally been the long pole in the tent, but in this, kind, in this instance it might be where do we find some more uh, folks who can actually get into the IT network and, and, and figure out what's going on and help us bring it back up. Um, and then one of the other interesting things that came up in terms of interdependencies you might not think about. So you, as Ted said, you can think about all of the industries that rely on all of the things in our lives that rely on electricity, <coughs> all of the things that rely on communications, et cetera. Um, what wasn't immediately obvious, for example, was that if the electricity is out for an extended period of time and the electricity companies are trying to, whether it's you know, put out copper wire or move big transformers or whatever they might be trying to do, that requires money. They're not collecting revenue from customers who are not getting electricity. And so that interdependency on the financial services sector to finance the work that needs to be done, those kinds of, and, that, and, and we, are, we, are, we are not where we should be, where we, need, where we will need to be in that understanding all of those interdependencies. It's why exercises are so important. It's why cross-sector exercises are so important to really uh, begin to understand those cascading consequences so that we can plan today, how are we gonna do that? What are the contractual relationships that you need to, are gonna need to have in place? What, that when we did the section nine catastrophic consequences list that the president, president uh, asked us to do under executive order 13636, look at all of the entities where a, where a successful cyber attack could we expect to have catastrophic consequences. Almost all of those were catastrophic economic consequences. And the focus then needs to be not just on, okay, how do we prevent this from happening, but how do we mitigate the economic consequences so that if an adversary is using the threat of economic warfare to freeze us in place, to deter us from doing something in our national interests, we are not so brittle and susceptible to that kind of extortion.
Yeah, before I open up the question, I, I want uh, questions from the audience. I want to uh, put one more thing out there for, for Scott and Steve um, to comment on. And, and Suzanne you know, ended by saying an adversary, right? So this is not a natural disaster that we're talking about. Um, this was, you know, an adversarial attack. And, and again, with the private sector at the crosshairs of this, um, you know, whether it's the banks or, or large international companies, uh, they're very involved in the international economy. Uh, you know, they, they have clients, they have board members, they have, you know, C-suites that are involved in either they're, they're not Americans to begin with or they are very involved in international commerce. Um, and, you know, just, just some thoughts on how do we begin to open the aperture to think through um, this this very tricky aspect of what happens in the event of a cyber enabled economic uh, attack, not a natural disaster in that respect. Yeah, so we, 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 we sort of break the world into two parts, right? What, what happens as you approach or you're at boom and to the right of boom uh, from a recovery and how do we stop the pain uh, perspective and then left of boom, how do we maneuver better long before it so we avoid it, right? On the right of boom scenario, I think what we found out is as soon as you remove PII from the equation and you're talking about TTPs and specific observations about how a network was compromised, what the tools were, where were they observed in other places, why, could it, why shouldn't have we seen that happening? I, I actually don't think there's a lot of sensitivities for the financial institutions to be able to share that with their government partners. I think the give to get uh, relationship when FSR was stood up, um, you know, was built around this idea that, hey, we will, uh, we will educate our government partners and particularly in the defense community and cyber command about how our critical must run functions operate. What are the, inter what's the interconnectivity between the business processes, the market functions, the specific technologies that support them. And the, the, the return on investment is if we have a bad day and we're under attack, that you have a contingency plan um, and you've done some homework on based on various thresholds of impact that you've thought through how you're going to react to this and what you need from the private sector uh, to enable you to, to suppress that activity before that bad day happens. And so, you know, we formed a lot of our projects around doing that. Now, what you learn really quickly when you start working with your government partners in that space is that if you get out of that, um, um, the, the defense world, and you get into the intelligence community more on the Title 50 side, the more we work together to unify our understanding of the threat with the government, the better. The more we look at strategic warning, meaning that, you know, hey, if there's tools development being deployed uh, in, in the Ukraine and we see outcomes, the, the intelligence community might not understand that those tools can be used to hit at the heart of something, to Suzanne's point, that is a critical must-run system. That may not be obvious to, to our partners in the intelligence community. So I think, uh, you know, far left of boom, we need to be working on educating folks about what the impact could be so we deal with it and can maneuver before we have to go deal with cyber command to suppress it, right? And we kind of, you know, start to separate those. Let's have the contingency plan. Let's work through that with the defense community. Let's keep PII out of it. Um, it makes it less difficult to deal with. And that, but let's keep pressure on the intelligence piece of it to get further and further left of boom so that hopefully over time, the intelligence community can harmonize its collection practices consistent with what really matters for the financial sector or the power sector. And the last thing I'll say is what we learned is you don't actually start this whole thing on the threat side of the equation. You start this by looking at your building and saying, before we figure out you know, how to forecast hurricanes better. How can we make sure that building withstands a Category 5 hurricane? And what you find out is if you focus in what we did at FSR and as a sector, you know, what are those 14 things? What are the top three ones? How do we make those withstand more? You, you have to basically deconstruct the building and rebuild it. That's where you really learn the things the intelligence and the defense community can then mobilize to be more effective in their response to it. Um, and so, you know, it really is back to the business processes and, you know, to Ted's point, understanding your system better. And I think the sectors have some work to do to make sure they, they among themselves, work on the interconnectivity because I think we have to bring that back to the government in a digestible way for our government partners to be able to use. Mm 
Um, before we go so, quickly to, to QA, but it, yeah, yes. two, two brief points to your, yeah. to, your, to your question. One is the geopolitical implications of cyber uh, enabled economic warfare, where countries might be able to retreat to their geographic boundaries, but most companies cannot retreat right. to a particular country's geographic boundaries um, as a result of the fact that even large, you know, American uh, headquartered companies have. Um, equities throughout the world and the architecture and the infrastructure uh, and where data is stored in cloud environments. So, so they cannot retreat to, to the same, to, in the same way that a government can consider it government versus government. That's not how the private sector views it. Um, the second point is um, you talked about the private sector being on the front lines. I think um, if I were to say the largest problem with all of cybersecurity um, is that we've recognized that the private sector is on the front lines. Um, but we have not empowered um, in any way, shape, or form economically the private sector to do what needs to be done with the government to resolve this at a higher level so it's not getting to all these people. Every person, every business should not be on the front lines of a national security problem. It's crazy, right? We've allowed that to occur. Instead of figuring out what is the higher level um, through an internet ecosystem where the government and the telecommunication services, the internet providers, the domain services, how could they all work together so that this threat doesn't reach every end user? We've instead said we need more workforce, crazy response to a problem. Right? It's like having an arsonist in a neighborhood saying we don't need to get the arsonist, let's get more firefighters. Um, or looking um, at another analogy, if you look at what happened in Flint, Michigan, right, where you have water that cannot, um, is not potable, no one can drink it, is the response, let's have every business and home have a filtration system and the capability to use it? Of course not. You go to the reservoir on the pipe level. You don't make everybody responsible for it. Um, we are approaching this problem backwards, and as long as we approach it backwards, we need too many people in order to resolve it instead of making sure that we're doing it efficiently and that we're paying those who need to be on the front lines of cybersecurity to have that national security approach and to pay them for being on those front lines. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, so let's open it up to uh, uh, discussion, uh, comment, that you please use the mic. Um, introduce yourself. Uh. Hi, uh, Rick Weber, Inside Cybersecurity. Um, so the report does a very good job of describing what's at stake and, and the recommendations, 20 plus recommendations, sweeping recommendations, redefining government's relationship with the private sector. How does this get implemented? Is this something that Congress has to do? How do what's the, what are the next steps? Suzanne, I'm going to turn to, to you since you were on this when you were in, you know, in government pushing things ahead. Well, <coughs> it, uh, it helps me to get back to your original question, which I never really answered, which was who's in charge, right? Um, because normally, uh, you know, these kinds of recommendations, if they're going to be taken seriously by an administration, you know, would be handed to your cybersecurity coordinator or perhaps your assistant to the president for homeland security uh, because they would have the, you know, they would be working on a daily basis with all of the players on the government side who would also then be working with the private sector folks uh, on this on a daily basis and they would pull together a task force and they would look at which of these do we want to accept and how would we implement them. Um, and the, uh, it's, so it makes it all the more unfortunate that today that would really sort of have to fall to Bolton, uh, who would also have to be uh, effectively chairing the cyber response group and the unified cyber coordinating group in the event of an incident. Um, so I think it's another, I, I think effective implementation of these recommendations will be hampered uh, as so much of but our cyber coordination are is. Are new laws needed? By having Do you think we have the laws that are needed? You know, does it, does it punt to Congress that we actually need to be able to do the prioritization of what we have talked about? I don't or does think, that yeah. exist and now we just got to get to it? I don't think we need new laws to do the prioritization. I think, as Steve said, I mean, a lot of this, the prioritization is going to depend on your ability to analyze uh, particularly consequences, and, and as we've talked about, these interdependencies, cascading consequences, <clears throat> that's going to be the a key input into how you prioritize your activities. And the National Risk Management Center that's been set up at DHS is set up to do exactly that. They're, they're moving from an asset-based focus and prioritization, right? After 9-11, we had this list of, of assets and buildings and structures across the country that and prioritized those in terms of what, which were most important. And we've, we've moved to a recognition that it's really functions. Uh, 
where are the key functions? Where are these key nodes that are at a higher level? Where if we focused our efforts on building resilience uh, and risk management there, we could stop a lot of the harm. Making that happen does not require a new law. Uh, it, it does require making the business case. It requires, you know, making sure that all of the folks who come to the table understand why they should come to the table, what they get back. Yeah, I, I think both Scott and Steve yeah. want to just. Uh, I, I'll make a minor comment. I, I I agree. The foundational work that the NRMC has done, the National Risk Management Center, has created a, a coordination capability for this work that didn't exist across the government. The one thing I think that we struggle with as a sector is that you know. Uh, is when we were working with the defense and intelligence uh, community, which we do through DHS now that there's a mechanism there to, to do that, um, I think there's a conflation of what is legally acceptable and then what has been adopted as policy. Um, among the executive branch agencies. Our hope is that, you know, through NRMC now and through DHS's new CISA program where we've got a consolidated cyber agency that we can get the intelligence and defense community with the sector specific agencies working more side by side with the sector in a way where maybe the intelligence and defense community wasn't comfortable doing before. And I think we've actually had some successes in doing it. I haven't perceived, and I think we've been at the front line on, on this effort, we haven't perceived a legal constraint to doing that, but you got to have a whole lot of executive policy discussions about who's doing what, and that takes up a lot of sector bandwidth. Uh, I'm not sure we've got it perfectly right yet, but we're trying Steve, to. Steve, you want to say a quick comment before we get to another question? Uh, well, I think we've had a market failure, so I agree with Scott that we don't have any legal impediments. We've said that before, but if, if I could think of a law that's needed, um, it was interesting to me to find that when we wanted to bring telephone service and broadband service into rural America and there wasn't an economic purpose for that, we created a Connect America Fund to fund that. And then I realized we don't even we don't have a Protect America Fund. So we keep rolling things out without any idea for security. How are you going to fund at the higher level um, this new strategy where the fewer corporations can do for the greater good more? And so you know make a Protect America Fund, take 10% of the military's budget for all I care, and have requests for proposals of what would it take for example, to get rid of all botnets in three years, right? These are the, the command and control platforms that ransomware is being used, that all the economic espionage campaigns are being used from. Eliminate them in three years at the higher level so no one has to deal with them. It's an economic issue. I am uh, Bill Nelson, uh, CEO of the Global Resilience Federation, formerly FSISAC, and I took part in that exercise. It was fantastic. What, what I noticed, though, that week Two days after that exercise, which was targeting, you know, a, well, a nation state attack against the transportation, the energy sector, and the financial services sector, two days later, we saw an attack against Poland, who had just signed a deal with the United Kingdom to buy natural gas that attacked their transportation and their energy sector. Do we have a playbook to defend ourselves? Because this stuff's happening all the time. We saw it in the financial services sector 2012 13 with Iran. <laughs> we see it with other countries, South Korea. Saudi Arabia, I mean, are we ready? Do we have a playbook, cross-sector playbook, private sector, public sector playbook to respond to something like that? I'll take just a piece of it. Um, I think probably in the last year and a half, two years, there's been more effort on exactly those kind of cross-sector dependencies. Uh, uh, we have had, uh, as you were explaining, some uh, exercises that I think start to identify where the gaps are and where the weaknesses are. Um, I, I guess I'm a big believer that you, you need a few core pieces in place, but trying to get too specific with playbooks for this or that or some other thing, you're, you're never going to really guess the exact set of circumstances. Um, and we haven't talked about it here. We did a lot in the tabletop exercise uh, a few months ago. I'm actually pretty confident in the informal network that exists. Um, at least I saw this uh, in the electric sector. When you get below the CEOs and so on, and you actually get to the engineers in the field, and you get to the uh, folks that are in the cyber command centers, um, they're quite free about sharing information. Uh, and they band together quickly, pick up the phone, hey, what are you seeing? This is what I'm seeing. 
how is this going to work? Uh, so I, I think it's some combination of having this top-down piece, but I wouldn't want us to forget the importance of that informal network. Uh, and a lot of that is getting people together through these exercises. They, uh, they establish those relationships. They bring a lot of those relationships from things they did before. Uh, and I think that's actually one of the, the strengths. If we really get hit with a serious cyber attack, I think that informal network is probably going to do more of the yeoman's work than a lot of fancy top-down uh, efforts. So I, I would just add that, that the relationships are really important to me, implicit in what Ted is saying. And this is one of the reasons that the private sector is going out on its own and trying to create some cross-sector uh, organizations and relationships. And so I, my friend Tom Fanning, CEO of Southern Company, the company who worked with Ted and I and so many others uh, over the years, uh, working very hard on a tri-sector group to bring in electricity to start with, electricity, finance, and communications. Um, without, you know, they'd like the government to come along, but the private sector recognizes that these relationships at the CEO level will be important. Uh, before we go to the next question, I just uh, I want to use my moderator privilege to, <laughs> to say we didn't at this tabletop, we did not forget um, uh, that, that third actor that is out there, which is the public, the citizen. Right. And there was, you know, a, a robust, again, discussion on, you know, do we have, if not the playbook, but who is in charge of, of telling the citizen if the banking is, is system is under stress during a time of, of a cyber-enabled economic warfare or, or electricity outages or, uh, uh, you know, store, st uh, shelves in stores are, are starting to go bare. Um, that was a, a key component of our discussion as well. Hi, uh, Sean Lingus with CyberScoop. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, potential blowback of the U.S. government going on the offensive. I imagine that topic came up during the roundtable with former government officials and industry executives uh, at the table. Um, what were the specific concerns that were raised from the private sector uh, side, and how did the former government folks try to reassure, is not the right word, but bring their perspective into, and, and how, how did those divergent views sort of get consolidated during the exercise. Mm -hmm. Steve, do you want to? Well, I, I, what's interesting about the question is I, I think that there is more of a sense that the government is not going to step in mm -hmm. and have affirmative actions that will make the pain stop for the private sector than the reverse. And really, I think during this tabletop exercise, at least, that, that tended to be the focus. Can the private sector expect that the government will be able to help in any number of ways, right? When you say offensive, we considered the full you know, range of diplomatic, informational, military, economic, law enforcement, this whole dime LE, national elements of national power that the country can bring to bear on any situation, or is the private sector on its own? And that tended to be the stress factor, um, as, as was already mentioned with the DDoS attacks of the financial services sector. That was, I think, a big lesson learned. You know, where does, where does an event continue? with it at least appearing to the private sector that the government is not stepping in to assert its strength against um, potentially another nation state, and when is the point where the country is going to come in at the national level, at the government level, and say, we are going to use your information to have you know, that type of reaction. Um, there's uh, little precedent, I think, right now for considering your question, other than the fact that our international strategy does say that an attack against our you know, public or the government that depending on what the effects are, it, would be, it could be treated as a military incident. Um, but we've shown a lot of capability at the government level to use economic sanctions, law enforcement sanctions to go against other nations. But to Sean's point, I mean, I think there was, a, my recollection is that there was a recognition that depending on what uh, offensive action the government might decide to take, that it was important to have represented at the table when those decisions are being made uh, private sector perspective that understood they could bear the brunt of any retaliation. And so the, even the attacks on the banks in 2012 and 2013, the DS attacks, were uh, in theory a retaliation for the role they played in implementing sanctions against Iran. Uh, so uh, again, I think you know, we certainly, when I was at DHS, we were very mindful that as we came to the table in those discussions, part of what we were there to do was to was to try to bring that private sector perspective into that conversation 
and, and not to freeze action, but to understand that uh, private sector may bear the brunt of the retaliation, and how do we mitigate that? And that was the foundational kind of question concept at the start of our project on cyber-enabled economic warfare, that through pressure on the private sector, through cyber means in this case, that it could change the direction at the national level for national strategy because the pain that the, the private sector and citizens were bearing, at some point they say, just make it stop, right? And what would that lead to in terms of our national strategy? Um, okay. Uh, a few more questions. Hey, uh, Joe Marks from the Washington Post. Uh, Stephen, you said earlier that's a canard that um, you know legal liability was an issue for information sharing from the from the from industry. So how the heck do we get them to actually do it, given that they haven't yet? And then Suzanne, obviously you worked on this, and I'm sure uh, have some thoughts on that. So, so um, one thing that um, I think Ted pointed out is in areas where it's really <coughs> mattered. Um, and when there are active um, investigations or active um, incidents, that there's a lot more sharing going on than people see. Um, and that's without all of these protections, right? Meaning, meaning that those weren't required. They were assurances that were given often through legislation, but that even prior to legislation, that information would have been able to be freely shared. And I, I think that it gets back to what we said earlier, that if there's an actual need and there's an actual gap, and getting that information is going to make a difference, that there is a lot of sharing of information going on. If, if I could maybe just jump in. I perceive maybe a bit of a difference with the electric sector than perhaps some of the others. The electric sector is uniquely domestic. It's not owned by foreign companies. Those companies, at least the investor-owned utilities, very few of those holding companies own utilities in other countries. It's really, for all intents and purposes, it is a domestic industry. So the pressures of, well, do we really want to share this information or are we worried about uh, how our foreign owners or board members or whatever may feel, that I, I think that's largely absent. It does not exist in the electric sector. So it may sound a little overly patriotic, but in my opinion, uh, if we had an issue that attacked, in a significant way, attacked the, the electric sector, I think it would be all hands on deck. It would all be about how do we work with the government. Frankly, there would probably be a, a fair amount of sentiment of would like some shooting back <laughs> because it's too hard to uh, defend this entirely on our own. Uh, and I think that that sector would be very much lashed around trying to get uh, the electric system restored as quickly as possible with very little other consideration. I think it would be fair to note as well there are a couple of sectors that are highly regulated, including energy and financial, that they have to share certain information. So I think the issue is, is all, uh, you know, long before the intense focus on cyber, going back to the sort of physical days, uh, responding to storms, et cetera, what we found terrorist incidents, for example. What we have always known is, in the event of an incident, that's not where your information sharing problems are going to be most intense, because almost always people rally around. They, they've got, they, 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 everybody's focused on trying to solve this urgent problem. Uh, intelligence community and law enforcement are much more likely to be willing to share information with victims and potential victims. Uh, folks who have, who have information that they think can help are much more likely to come forward with that information. Really, the challenge is on the day-to-day, -day, uh -huh. always, in, in, uh -huh. and cyber is no different. And because it's harder to make that business case, as Steve That's talked an excellent about. Point. And, and yet, it is that day-to-day -day activity that pinging that, that those, those millions of attacks all across the country on critical infrastructure, that data that can be so incredibly valuable. And I think increasingly the private sector gets it. We've done a pretty good job of convincing people that if you share data, you're going to be better off. So now they're sharing with ISACs. They're sharing within their own private sector organizations, not necessarily with the government. And at DHS, the system that we constructed <coughs> basically sort of says, that's OK. If you're more comfortable sharing with each other and not directly with the government, you do that. The, those ISACs are nodes in this automated information sharing. Um, and they will still get the information, and they can send information that's been anonymized. It doesn't all have to be a hub and spoke mm. come right down mm. to the government. And very quickly, very quickly. Sure. John Pelson from Spotlight Software. 
In the weeks after 9-11, all the talk was that the next major attack would be cyber. And here we are, why have we gone almost two decades now without a massive attack in the U.S.? Well, I, I, I mean, I would defer to some of my private sector folks, but we've had some pretty significant attacks. If you're, if you're one has been attacked, it's pretty ugly. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking hundreds but, of millions of dollars for specific companies yeah. um, after not Petya alone. Uh, I mean, pharmaceuticals, have really, some of those have been hit where they have lost production capability. I mean, there have been some pretty serious events. And in any event, I think you always have to be thinking in terms of what, what is that potential and let's make sure we're really uh, as well protected and as well organized uh, as we can be I would in just, advance. I would just say that because attribution has gotten better, most nation states have a deterrence factor against the United States. Up until recently, private sector economic hacks have wanted the systems to remain up, and we have now started seeing more of the hackers for profit using destructive attacks. And I think that, that that has shown a rise. And then we've seen incidents where we think destructive attacks have spread, but not intentionally. Um, that could be nation state sponsored. So but those, I, those, yeah. that would be my response to you. And I think um, really having a significant impact on operational uh, and sustained impact on operational activity through an attack on industrial control systems is harder than people think. Um, it's, not, it's, it's just getting into the industrial control system network is not enough to have a sustained and significant physical impact. Uh, I think our, our, our time is up, um, but first of all, I want to really, I want to thank the panel so much uh, for participating in October and for, for today. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on your way out, uh, please uh, take in, uh, the publications and the one from this uh, tabletop, it does have a list of recommendations. So now we have to, you know, put our shoulder to the grindstone and actually uh, uh, think through how to operationalize those things. So Thank you again. Make it there you go. Yeah. <laughs>